In today's video, we're gonna talk about the basics of how a construction schedule is put together. I'm gonna to explain what a critical path schedule is by first explaining how a schedule originates, as well as the meaning behind some of the scheduling terms involved. Today, we'll be looking at a basic example of some construction activities and their corresponding relationships. In future videos, I'm gonna expand on this information with an in-depth series of how to establish a baseline schedule, then how to manage and update complex construction construction schedules inside actual construction scheduling software. So let's go. All right, so first we've got to understand how a project schedule originates, which is dependent on the type of owner or client we're working with, the type of contract we'll have, and the type of project we're working on. No construction project is typical, so no project schedule is going to be typical. You could be building franchised construction projects, which is in essence the same building or project over and over, but variables such as where the project is located, what the local labor workforce looks like, what time of year you're building could all drastically impact what the project schedule looks like. So let's assume we have an owner or a client who knows nothing about construction but wants to build a building. This owner approaches both an architect and a general contractor or construction manager for this project and the owner is going to ask how much it's going to cost and how long it will take to design and build. This is all critical information to the owner because the owner is typically building something to get a return on their investment. The owner is looking at the cost of construction and potential profitability from that project. The owner is also going to be looking for a schedule as part of their consideration to take this idea to actual construction. So the faster this project is designed and built, the faster the owner receives their return on their initial investment. So schedules are just as important to owners as project costs are because the cost of a building sitting incomplete could financially impact this owner who is not earning profits on the building when they potentially could or should be. So this is why commercial construction contracts are typically and most often written with defined project completion dates. Whether there are liquidated damages or other consequential damages incorporated and tied to those completion dates is just another topic for another day. So just as a general contractor can provide a square foot price estimate of a building in programming or conceptual phases of construction based on previously completed projects of a similar scope, they can do the same thing with a schedule. For instance, Instance. Let's say we know the owner wants to build out a commercial retail space and we as the GC or CM are given the approximate square footage of this potential project. Well, we've recently completed three similar projects at a similar square footage. We can compare the timelines of those previous projects as well as incorporating new variables that we may know. And this is how we would generate a rough schedule or overall duration of this project to help inform the owner's decision making. So as design continues, we start to understand more and more specifics to the project. Thus, we can refine the budget through conversations with key subcontractors, as well as refining the schedule through these same conversations. The closer a GC or CM gets to compiling final bid documents, the more refined the schedule should become with clear expectations and milestone dates. And then at this point, the schedule starts to shift from what was broad durations to now incorporating these milestone dates as well as specific activities. General contractors and construction managers work out a presentable and manageable schedule, which ultimately gets incorporated into the bidding documents that all contractors will be submitting their pricing against. So when general contractors, construction managers, trade contractors, and subcontractors are bidding on commercial construction projects, they're not only committing to certain budgets with the owner, they're also committing to certain schedules, site logistic plans, and other contract documents that they've all reviewed and said, yes, we all agree we can do this and meet these parameters. So let's pause here for a moment and talk about why so many construction projects seem to have highly aggressive schedules, meaning shorter timeframes. Now, at some point, every individual or company working on any given project agreed and bought into some baseline schedule prior to committing to that project. However, through the competitive bidding process, it continues to not only pinch profits, but also these scheduled durations, forcing these schedules to be shorter and shorter. So the bigger question is how many companies are over committing and therefore forcing underperformance and failure through this bidding process? We hear so many projects in the news getting into lawsuits because they've missed their turnover dates. Again, a good discussion for another day. 
Okay, so we've learned that project schedules are influenced through buy-in from all parties and are ultimately then established by the general contractor or construction manager in a set of bid documents to meet the needs of the client while still holding reasonable timeframes that everyone can uphold. So how do GCs and CMs take all this information from past projects, from subcontractors, from this current project scope, combine all this knowledge and generate the most reasonable yet competitive schedule? Well, they all utilize a scheduling practice known as the critical path method, which I'm sure you've heard the term used before. The critical path is the longest amount of time it'll take to complete a construction project through a series of activities with zero float or slack that must happen in a sequential order. Float and slack are interchangeable terms and I'll explain them in just a minute. The term longest in that previous statement confused me when I was first learning about CPM schedules, but the keywords to pay attention to are really float and slack. Also, I don't really think there's a good way to verbally explain CPM schedules, at least for me, without a good visual representation to go along with it. But I'm gonna provide a little more context before we get into that example. So this critical path is based on a series of construction activities that must happen in a sequential order to complete the project. An activity in a schedule is an aspect of scope that has been given a set duration of time. But a construction schedule isn't one path of activities from start to finish. It's multiple paths of activities that originate from one single starting point and end at the same finish point through a series of relationships with one another. As you know, multiple activities can be happening on a project simultaneously. Activities or scope all have different relationships with one another based on the sequence of how this building is going to be built. Only one of those paths, though, is deemed the critical path, while the other paths have activities that have float or slack. We call the one path critical because zero hiccups can happen on that path or else it will directly extend the finish date of the construction project. So to reiterate, activities that are not on the critical path have float or slack, meaning that there could be potentially some hiccups or delays to those activities and the end date of the project will likely be okay. Now, a project schedule is a living, breathing document that needs regular attention and regular updating to ensure that the project is still on track. The critical path can, however, change throughout the duration of a project based on these real-time schedule updates. So this schedule is comprised of a start date, a series of activities, potentially some milestone dates, and a finish date. If you recall, an individual activity is any defined scope of work with a set duration, meaning that you have a task and an associated time with it. So how do these activities get their durations defined? How do we know what time to assign to any given activity? Well, construction workers, or any worker for that matter, have productivity rates, and there are resources online such as RS Means that track these productivity rates on a national scale with modifiers based on the city or state that you might be working in. Most companies track their own production rates to ensure that they're building out accurate schedules and budgets on future projects. So let's look at an example of a productivity rate for installing a door frame and how it relates back to our schedule. Let's say it takes one person one hour to install a door frame. Well, that's our production rate. Now, let's say our estimate captured 500 door frames on this project. So if we do the math, it would take one person 500 hours to install 500 door frames, which is the equivalent of about 12 and a half weeks or a little bit over three months. Well, let's just say that doesn't work out with our overall project schedule needs. And let's say that we need it done in approximately four weeks to maintain the flow of this project. Well, we can't really just adjust productivity in this equation. So the only other thing is crew size. If we utilize a three person crew in lieu of one person, we cut the time by three. 12 weeks turns into four weeks. Now you won't be doing this on every activity in your schedule, but this is how you would use production rates to generate schedule durations. You'd use this if you wanted to calculate or back check whether durations in your schedule are accurate or not. I'm just sprinkling this into this video because production tracking is directly tied to both scheduling and a future video I'll make in regards to forecasting and profitability of a job, which is the large aspect of project management. So I'd argue that compiling an accurate construction schedule and understanding 
understanding project sequencing is one of the most difficult tasks for a majority of people to grasp when first entering the construction industry. So just like anything, this is a learned skill that you'll need to work on and develop over time. Project scheduling is your roadmap that influences not only what your project should be doing today, but what you should be focused on and planning months in advance. Ultimately, the schedule needs to be a balance of having enough information to make sense to be constructible without too much detail that bogs down and confuses people. Too much detail might leave less flexibility to adapt to unforeseen changes when you need to update your schedule or activity relationships in the future. Now every project schedule should have at least two milestones. Milestones are points in time with zero duration associated with the activity and are there to establish a goal or a target. The two milestones every project is going to have will be your start milestone and your finish milestone. Other milestones may include structure being complete, envelope dry-in, in-wall inspections, above ceiling inspections, final inspections, and more. They're included as a straightforward measurement to determine whether or not the project is on track or not. Aside from your start date and finish date milestones, every other remaining activity will have relationships to other activities in the form of both predecessors and successors. A predecessor is an activity that happens before a specific activity. A successor is an activity that happens after a specific activity. Now this might sound simple, but the importance of the statement is because many people create schedules where activities lack either a predecessor or a successor. These are considered open loops in a schedule that could lead to inaccurate overall durations based on logic driven in the schedule or your scheduling software. So I previously mentioned activity relationships, which is essentially how activities are tied to one another, and there are four of them when it comes to scheduling. The first activity relationship type is a finish to start or FS relationship, meaning that one or more activities, the predecessor or predecessors, must all be fully complete before the following activity, the successor, may begin. This is the most common type of activity relationship and we'll use this in our example shortly. Next we have a start to start or SS relationship. This means an activity cannot start unless another related activity has started as well. Then we have a finish to finish or FF relationship. This is rarely used but it means that an activity is only deemed finished when its related activity is also finished. Finally, the fourth and last relationship type is a start to finish or SF relationship. This is also rarely used, but it means that an activity cannot finish until a predecessor activity has started. All right, so we've made it to our CPM schedule example. Now this example is a manual calculation of what construction scheduling software will do for us, but we need to first understand how this works on paper so that we can understand what's happening behind the scenes in our scheduling software. Once you understand how to manually calculate how a CPM schedule works, you'll likely never need to manually write out a schedule again because your software is going to work 10 times faster. Okay, so this example has a starting milestone. This example has a finish milestone. This example will have eight activities in between, which I'll label activity A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and activity H. So I'm connecting these activities together with lines, which is how we would sequence this project as part of putting together this overall schedule. These lines represent the relationships these activities have with one another. Each line in this example indicates a finish to start relationship, meaning that the successor cannot start until all predecessors have been completed. So for example, activity G is a successor to both activities B and D. Activities B and D are predecessors to activity G, meaning both activities B and D need to be completed prior to activity G starting. Activity G is also simultaneously a predecessor to our finish milestone. Remember, all activities except our start and finish will have both predecessors and successors. Now you see I have six empty boxes within each activity, which are gonna be used to calculate our critical path through what we call a forward pass and a backwards pass through the schedule. These boxes will represent each activity's total duration or time associated. 
These boxes will represent the activity's early start, or ES, as a number which is the earliest these activities can logically start based on their predecessors finishing. Again, this will all make sense in just a minute once we start putting this all into action, so stick with me, we're almost there. These boxes will represent the activity's early finish, or EF, as a number which is the earliest these activities can logically finish based on the early start, ES, plus the activity's duration. These boxes will represent the activity's late start, or LS, which I'll further explain shortly. These boxes will represent the activity's late finish, or LF, which is the latest these activities can finish without extending the end date of the overall construction project schedule. Finally, these boxes represent float, or otherwise known as slack, which is the amount of time an activity can be delayed without impacting the overall duration of the project. The critical path will appear when and we've calculated the path that has zero float. So now we're gonna start and we're gonna manually find our critical path by completing what we call the forward and backwards pass through our network of scheduled activities. So I'm gonna start by adding in all of our durations to each individual activity until we have a duration associated with every activity. Next, we're gonna take a look at our starting milestone and we're gonna give this milestone a zero because milestones do not have durations associated with them. So we're at our starting milestone and we see that activity A, C, and E are all directly related to our start, meaning that they can commence after our starting milestone has finished. Since our starting milestone has zero duration associated, these activities can start right away, meaning that their early start or ES will also be zero. So we've officially started our forward pass through this schedule. So if activity A has an early start of zero and an activity duration of six, what is the earliest this activity can finish, otherwise known as the EF, early finish? Well, if we take our early start of zero and add our activity duration, which is six, we get a total of six. So the earliest this activity can finish is six days later. So we're gonna fill that in to our early finish date. Next, we have activity C, which also has that zero in the early start, but this activity has a four day duration, which means that the earliest it's going to be able to finish is at that day four, once we add our zero plus our four. And we do the same thing with activity E. Now jumping back up to the top, activity A has finished and its successor, which is activity B, is now able to start through the finish to start relationship. So activity A finished at day six, which means that activity B can technically also start on day six. So we carry that through to activity B's early start. Activity D and F are both successors to activity C. So we carry the four through these as well. Then we fall back and we do our calculation for activity B's early finish or EF. It started on day six. It has a three day duration, which means the earliest it can finish is on day nine. Okay, so we do the same math and the same calculation for activity D and activity F. Now, what happens with activity G? Activity G is a successor to both activity B and activity D. This means that G cannot start until both B and D are complete, which means G is reliant on whichever activity of its predecessors is gonna take the longest. Well, activity B ends on day nine and activity D ends on day eight, which means that activity G cannot start until day nine since it's waiting on the longest activity to finish. Now the same goes for activity H. Its predecessors are activity E and activity F. Since activity E has a longer duration, activity H is waiting on both to finish, but the earliest activity H can start is when activity E, the longer of the two, is wrapped up. So we transfer that day 10 to our activity H early start. Now again, we drop back and do our calculations Add day nine plus two days of activity, we get day 11. Adding day 10 plus three days of activity duration, and we get day 13. So finally, we're at our finished milestone, which is dependent on both activity G and activity H being completed. 
Well, activity G can wrap up, but the project won't be complete until activity H is also completed. Since H is ending later, then our finished milestone has to be associated with H, which is on day 13. So we've determined the length of our project by completing this forward pass, but we have not established what our critical path yet, so we have to complete a backwards pass. So essentially, we're just gonna do the same process we did for the forward pass, but we're gonna do it in reverse. So the top was our early start and our early finish. The bottom is gonna be our late start and our late finish. So 13 is where we ended up, so we'll drop this in activity G and H's late finish. In order to calculate our late start boxes, we need to take our late finish and subtract the activity duration. So for activity G, we'll take that 13 and we'll subtract our activity duration, which is two days, and we'll get a late start of day 11. We'll do the same calculation for activity H. We'll take the late finish of day 13, subtract our activity duration of three days, and we'll get a late start of day 10. Now we're just gonna continue this process working backwards with these same calculations through our schedule. Okay, I've gotten to a point where I've hit three successors to one predecessor, but each of these successors have different late starts. So what do we do here? Activity A has a late start of two, activity C has a late start of three, and activity E has a late start of zero. Well, if you recall on our forward pass, we took the larger of the two numbers when we were trying to figure out the early start of activity G. It's the opposite logic on the backwards pass. We'll take the lowest number in any of these scenarios with multiple successors to one predecessor. So in this case, we're gonna take zero and feed it back to our start milestone. So we've completed both the forward pass and the backwards pass, which now has given us enough information to calculate this float and slack that I keep talking about. Float or slack is calculated by taking your late start and subtracting your early start. You can also take your late finish and subtract your early finish. So for activity A, we're gonna take two days less zero days or eight days less six days and get two days. Our float for activity A is two days. For activity B, we take eight days less six days or 11 days less nine days, which results in activity B having two days of float as well. So we calculate the float for all of our activities, which now outlines a path of activities with zero float or slack along its entire sequence. This is our critical path on this project. So what this tells us is that if activity E takes longer than 10 days or activity H takes longer than three days, it's going to directly impact and extend our schedule beyond these 13 days. So this tells me that we better keep a close eye on these activities if we want this project done in 13 days because these activities are not allowed any hiccups. So on the flip side, every other activity in this schedule that is not on the critical path has float or slack associated with it after we've done these calculations. Which means for activity A, activity A can be delayed two days after it was originally planned to start without impacting the overall end date of day 13. It means that activity C can start three days after it was originally planned to start without impacting the overall end date of 13 days. This should now better explain what a late start on the activity means. Activity G doesn't need to start until day 11 for instance. However, if we use up more float than activity or sequence can afford, when we run the schedule update, our critical path is likely gonna change and our project end date is likely gonna change. The only way to recover on a critical path is to evaluate resequencing of relationships or to cut durations by using larger crew sizes. If you're working on a project and the schedule is not up to date, it's gonna be difficult to determine if you're heading towards your contracted end date or not. All right, so this was your introduction into understanding the basics of construction project scheduling. If you can grasp this, then you'll be much better suited in understanding scheduling techniques inside scheduling software. Okay, so that's enough for everyone's brain for today. So I'll catch you in the next video. And remember, be better, build better, and bye, bye for now. now. Oh.